Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. If this is your first time joining us for Fridays with Friedlander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Friedlander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question into the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished former neurosurgeon and trainees, Dr. and Pastor Leland Albright. As for that, Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin. Again, a pleasure to be with all of you here uh, today to uh, you know, provide a little update on the department. And uh, really, we're going to have a, a you're going to have a treat of a presentation uh, uh, today. Department, uh, uh, we're in uh, great shape. It's a beautiful day out in Pittsburgh uh, today. We have uh, blue skies. I could see from uh, my window. We had a recent uh, graduation. Our graduates are going into fantastic uh, career. Some of them are doing fellowships. Some of them are uh, going straight into really uh, impactful academic uh, careers. One of the treats in my job is really to see the passing of the torch from uh, one generation of uh, trainees uh, to the uh, next. Uh, we recruited uh, four outstanding uh, new uh, residents who graduated from uh, medical school. They're doing a fantastic uh, job or residents doing really great work and in the research and uh, I'm very, very proud of everything that they're doing. Our faculty really uh, doing very impactful uh, work, uh, teaching uh, many people, many visitors come here from uh, around the world as well as uh, patients and very proud of what the, the, the department is uh, doing. And uh, today uh, we ha we're very, very fortunate uh, to really have a iconic individual within the uh, Neurosurgery, Dr. Leland Albright, and as, uh, as Justin may mentioned, Pastor also Leland uh, Albright uh, is a former graduate and a faculty member here for many, many uh, years. Uh, was the chief of uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgery, really developing uh, many different aspects uh, within the field of uh, pediatric uh, neurosurgery. Uh, Dr. Albright has uh, several different uh, callings as well as interests uh, in his uh, life and uh, has done really phenomenal uh, work uh, around the world and particularly in uh, Kenya that he'll uh, describe uh, in terms of really uh, expanding the umbrella of who he's helped uh, initially people here in Pittsburgh and then in the U.S., but really uh, internationally and helping and training people in need. So um, you're going to have a treat uh, today. And uh, Dr. Albright, uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Friedlander. Thank you for the privilege of sharing some reflections on a career in pediatric neurosurgery with you and the others that are here with us today. Let me begin by describing my genesis for the career in neurosurgery itself. That began in 1968 when Peter Janetta finished his residency at UCLA and came to the LSU Medical School to develop uh, a division of neurosurgery. I was a junior medical student at the time and his lectures were charismatic, as you might expect, and so the following year as a senior med student, I did a six week rotation with him on neurosurgery at, Ch at Charity Hospital in New Orleans and decided, well, I'd like to be a neurosurgeon. Three years later, he came to UPMC to be the chief of neurosurgery, where he remained for so many years and became an international legend. I graduated from med school in 69, did an internship in internal medicine, a year of general surgery at Washington University, three years as a clinical associate in neurosurgery at the NIH, and then came in 1974 to UPMC to begin my neurosurgery residency. And at the time, I had never heard of pediatric neurosurgery. It was in its infancy. 
It had been brought to Children's in Pittsburgh for the first time in 1972 by Don Rigel after he finished his fellowship and he was the first fellowship trained pediatric neurosurgeon uh, at Children's in Pittsburgh. The second six months into the residency, I did a six month rotation with him on peds at Children's in Pittsburgh and I just loved it. I mean, he was a tumultuous uh, person, but I loved what I was doing. And so two years later came back, did another six month rotation and confirmed this is what I want to do with my life. This is who I want to be. And the career in pediatric neurosurgery has had five different segments. Two years at the University of Louisville, many years at UPMC and Children's, four years at the University of Wisconsin Health Center, a little over four years in Kajabi, Kenya, and then the years since then. And I'll discuss each of those in different time allotments. The two years in Louisville uh, gave me a, a better understanding of the Catholic concept of purgatory. Oh my gosh. They recruited me to develop pediatric neurosurgery there. That's what I thought they wanted. It turns out they wanted someone to cover trauma and the VA and pain patients and the pediatric cases they didn't want to do. So it was a really hard two years. But toward the end of it, Dr. Janetta invited me to come back to Children's and UPMC to join the faculty there. And I did and was on the faculty between 1981 and 2006. And those were the golden years of my career. Partly because I had two collegial collaborative colleagues between 92 and 2006. I couldn't have had better colleagues than Ian and David. We are such different personalities and yet we were able to work together in a, a, a wonderful way. I don't think it could have been get better. There was also the joy of superb residents. These were residents on uh, at, at uh, UPMC when I left in 2006 and there are names there of people who are current faculty incoming faculty nationally and internationally known superb residents there was there were many joys there was the joy of teaching monday morning and thursday afternoons in case conferences where ian david and i would have the residents present cases to us we would discuss them the potential treatments the risks the benefits the potential outcomes those were invaluable conferences for both the faculty and the residents. There was the joy of teaching in the operating room, and I learned the, the three decades maxim. The maxim that in the first decade after residency, a neurosurgeon learns how to operate. The second decade, they learn when to operate. The third decade, they learn something harder, when not to operate. But I've learned since then that there's actually a fourth decade maxim, and that is that there is no way to take the experience, the knowledge that you have gained in the previous three decades and transmit it to anyone else. Another joy was the five faculty teaching awards. Every one of them was deeply meaningful. They didn't make me feel proud, they they were they were validating because of my they validated my deep desire to really help teach the residents that worked with us. And then there was the opportunity to teach in visiting professorships, mostly around the US, but several in other countries, and those were always sources of joy. It, it was gratifying that uh, Ian, David, and I worked together to produce the three editions of the textbook that has become the standard textbook of pediatric neurosurgery. It's widely used in the US and in many countries around the world. So there were many sources of gratification and of joy in those years. 
Now, I learned something that you're going to experience, and that is that life turns on thin hinges. It's a statement that means that so often, well, at a few times in my life and yours, life will have been going along in a certain direction and things seem quite stable. And then you will experience something, whether it's something that you see or hear or read or watch or a person you need. And that experience changes your life. And for the rest of your life, it goes in a different direction. The first few years of my life back at Children's in Pittsburgh from 81 to 96, my focuses were on pediatric children who had brain tumors, and I worked closely with the Children's Cancer Group. In December of 1996, I went to a meeting, the pediatric section meeting, and I presented a paper, you see at 910, on the feasibility and advisability of resecting midline intraaxial gliomas in children. Nothing unusual there. But the next afternoon at 2.15, Warwick Peacock, who had just immigrated from the, uh, to the US from Cape Town, presented a paper called Selective Posterior Rhizotomy for the Relief of Spasticity. He had developed an operation that relieved the spasticity in the lower extremities of children who had cerebral palsy. And it was like an epiphany, I thought, wow, this is a way to treat thousands of children for which we currently have no treatment method. So I went out and spent time with Warwick. He uh, taught me how to do the procedure. I came back and established a spest uh, multidisciplinary spasticity clinic. But then over the next few years, we saw children with CP who had other forms of movement disorders and we developed other forms of treatment and ultimately had a multidisciplinary spasticity and movement disorders clinic that attracted children and young adults from around the country and a few from abroad because we had at the time ways of helping them. We had all of the ways that were hel uh, of helping them that were known. The the, the clinical care of those patients and research we did resulted in two significant publications. One of them was in 1991 in the Journal of the American Medical Association, showing that intrathecobaclofen improves spasticity in children with severe CP. It's a way of implanting a pump that infuses a chemical called baclofen into the spinal fluid, and it effectively alleviates spasticity with the infusion. And then 10 years later, we published in the Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology, a paper showing that intrathecal baclofen is helpful for children and young adults with severe generalized secondary dystonia. And for those people before this, there was no known effective treatment. Uh, I left Children's in Pittsburgh uh, in 2006 uh, for personal reasons that were related to going through a divorce. And when I left, the residents gave me a party and gave me a plaque that looked like this. And underneath it, so many of them, including Paul Gardner, Anand Germanwala, uh, Kostas Hajipanias down in the right hand corner. They wrote comments thanking me for uh, being there and for teaching them. And I tell you, honestly, this plaque meant more to me than than the national and international certificates and trophies and all of the other stuff I've gotten. It was invaluable. So I left in 2006 and went to the University of uh, Wisconsin in Madison for four years. It wasn't uh, as golden a year. Those weren't, weren't go as golden years as they were at Pittsburgh because I had a, uh, a non-collegial relationship with the colleague there. But um, 
I did establish a multidisciplinary spasticity and movement disorders clinic and did 358 procedures uh, to treat children with those disorders in the four years. And prior to our coming there, there was zero clinic. During that time, we determined that infusing baclofen into the ventricles for dystonia was highly effective, probably better than infusing it into the spinal fluid in the back. We published that and there's a more up-to-date manuscript that's been published since then. We also, uh, well, the teaching was another source, it was a continued source of joy. It just delighted me that uh, several of the residents went into academic neurosurgery and a couple became pediatric neurosurgeons. I got another couple of teaching awards and on leaving them in 2010, there was another plaque. And it was similar, you know, uh, well, this time it was their picture, but again, residents saying one after another that they valued the teaching that I had been able to do there. And again, just priceless affirmation, not something that made me proud, but that validated uh, what I was doing from the depths of my being. So I left there in 2006. I need to go back now a few years to another thin hinge. And we're going to come back to these later years. In September 26, 2001, I got an email at Children's in Pittsburgh with a subject neurosurgeon needed. And it was by somebody named R. Bransford at Kajabi.net. I had no idea who R. Bransford was or who Kajabi.net, who what Kajabi was. But this email turned out to be another thin hinge that would change the direction of my life thereafter. Turns out R. Bransford, Richard Dick Bransford, was this guy, a career medical missionary who, a surgeon medical missionary. So he was the old kind of surgeon missionaries that did everything, burn contractures, cleft lip, uh, uh, everything, he did everything. And he had been seeing for the last three or four years, sorry, he was in Kenya. That refers to Kajabi. So on the left slide, you see the circle around Kenya right on the equator. And Kajabi was two degrees below that. In the right picture, the arrow points to Kajabi, an hour and 20 minute drive up um, northwest from Nairobi on the edge of the Great Rift Valley. And he had been seeing children with hydrocephalus and spina bifida and had never been trained to treat those those children but he had a heart you know that wanted to treat them and being a neurosurgeon we so often figure out well i think i can do this and it probably will help so he started treating those the children with hydrocephalus with shunts in 1997 and closing the backs of children with spina bifida in 1997. And you see how the numbers increased until 2001 when he sent me that email. So I started going almost every year for two to four weeks to help take care of the children and to teach him all I could in two to four weeks. And over the course of the next eight years, his numbers increased a bit. I mean, nobody in the U.S. puts in 646 shunts a year or closes 294 spina bifida wounds. And in 2009, my wife Susan, who's a pediatric nurse, nurse practitioner, and I, we both had a strong inner sense 
that God wanted us to move to Kajabi to do and to teach pediatric neurosurgery. And so we did, September 1st, 2010. We, the Kajabi Hospital is a 254-bed general hospital, the ugliest hospital I've ever seen. It was founded in 1915 under the auspices of the Africa Inland Church, and its mission was to provide good medical care for poor people. My first goal was to teach pediatric neurosurgery fellows, people to be pediatric neurosurgeons, and the first one was Ugandan Humphrey Okechi. His fellowship was paid for by a grant from Medtronic. It was similar to US fellowships. I gave him exams every four months. The University of Nairobi said they would validate the uh, fellowship, but they changed their mind. Over the year, he did about 750 cases, uh, half or more of them with me and the others by himself. And at the end of the year, he became a Kajabi Hospital neurosurgery consultant and my colleague. We also, so then we uh, continued uh, educating residents from Nairobi. There were 16 over those four years. They had three months rotations with us. Those working hours, they were on call every two or three days. I gave, an, uh, gave them an exam at the start and at the end of the rotation and <clears throat> taught them how to read scans, how to analyze patients. What are the therapeutic options? What does the literature say? How to tie? They only knew how to instrument tie because that uses less suture than the hand tying that we do. I taught them surgical technique, basically how to be neurosurgeons because they were not getting that down in Nairobi. They were taught by either watching the attending or when they were chief residents by just doing it themselves. Helping us teach the residents, there were 14 visiting pediatric neurosurgeons from the United States. Two of them, Vitai Lee and, Sandy, and uh, Kathy Mazzola, who did their fellowships at Children's Hospital. We also wanted to teach with publications. And my wife, Susan, created a database. And for each patient she put in, she put in the data on every patient herself. Patient information, the procedures, the spinal fluid studies, the complications, and the contact information. You can see that this particular patient was number 4,431. And these data were a source of, of uh, they were the source of, of information for 17 different publications. Now, let me talk to you a bit about clinical care there. The daily census when we got there was 15 to 20. Within a couple of years, we were seeing, we had the census of 30 to 40 and rounds would take two hours every morning. We operated five days a week, but Humphrey and I each would operate only four days a week. You just can't do five days a week, and we often operated some, some on Saturday. We were doing about 100 cases a month, 1,200 a year, and we did over 5,000 in four years, Humphrey and I and the visiting neurosurgeons. It was really helpful to have years of experience before going to Kajabi. I mean, if a child came in and had this, um, I, I thought it probably was an unusual form of a lipomeningocele, and that's what it turned out to be. But you just can't, you couldn't assume that you could get an MRI and see because the patient may well, the family couldn't afford it. So there were a fair number of, of uh, the patients that Susan and I paid their way to go down to Kajab, down to Nairobi to have the scan and then to pay their way back. They presented late, often with advanced conditions. A lot of the children with tumors came in and they were blind because of pressure before they got there. 
they often couldn't afford to come, much less the treatment once they, once they got there. I got an email from a missionary who wanted to send to refer a child with a lipomeningocele. And the email said the mother's trying to get her ID and her travel permit. The father is going to the cattle camp on Sunday to sell his cow. I hope by the end of next week, the papers are ready and the cow is cashed. Some couldn't afford to come. Many of them went to traditional healers first. They were cheaper. They would be given herbs and poultices and often the traditional healers would burn the areas that the patient was having pain. Like you see in this, on the scalp in this child on the left, the four distinct burn marks for a child who had headaches. They didn't do much to help if you see the yellow era for the large posterior fossa tumor he had. This child came in with months of slowly worsening back pain and increasing leg weakness, and the burns did nothing to help for the spine deformity that he had because of severe TB at that level. The treatment decisions about many patients were difficult, often about money, but also about other reasons. In the United States in 32 years, I saw fewer than 20 children with the condition shown on the left scan, hydranencephaly. They basically have a, a brain stem and nothing above it. So they will be vegetative and generally die early. In four years in, in Kajabi, I saw 53. And we treated them in four different ways with ventriculoperitoneal shunts, with choroid plexus coagulation, choroid plexus plexectomy, and some with just comfort care, and published that the data oh, about two years ago, not the, and concluded that there is no good treatment for those children. It's still a, a dilemma every child. We had approximately two children admitted every day with hydrocephalus. The most common cause would be associated with spina bifida, but the second most common cause would be related to infection that they had as a baby that was misdiagnosed as being malaria. And then they would come in with an MRI, with a CT scan that looks like that. You see like whole, uh, collections of spinal fluid all throughout the head, and there is no straightforward way to treat that. If we wanted to use a, a, a shunt, a ventriculoperitoneal shunt to treat hydrocephalus, the ones that were available came from India. They cost uh, $26 a piece, and that's about what they were worth. Um, they often became disconnected, and they had a propensity for doing something that I never in all my years in the United States saw happen in the US. They often, the bottom end, penetrated the bowel and then came up and out the mouth or penetrated the abdominal wall or actually came out the rectum. And so, you know, you go to Africa having never seen anything like that and you need to find out how in the world do you treat that? And in each of those, it's a bit different. Uh, we did have a, a good uh, endoscope to do third ventriculostomies and choroid plexus coagulations. But this is high tech stuff. And uh, the fiber optics in the endoscope broke after six or eight months. And you know, you can't fix them. And so you have to ask somebody, will you give us another one? So we lived on donated supplies. Many of them were used. And of course, if they if they malfunctioned, they couldn't be repaired in Kenya. Most of them, you just had to get another one. Spina bifida at Children's in Pittsburgh, I saw about 25 cases a year. In Kajabi, we had 250 a year. Why? Four reasons. One, 
Kenyan family, uh, Kenyans families, they have many kids and the more children you have, the more chance that one of them would have it. They never, the mothers never take folic acid when they get, when they conceive. Now the government said uh, they mandated having folic acid in, in, in bread that's sold in the supermarkets. Well, Kenyans can't afford to go get their bread in the supermarkets. They grow their own maize, their, their corn. They have it ground, put it in a bag and put the bag back in the barn and it gets moldy. And in the mold, um, the mold itself produces fumonacin, which is a chemical that inhibits the DNA metabolism in the spinal cord of the fetus. And lastly, there's no uh, abortions done in Kenya. And none of those factors could easily be changed. So that when we left Kajabi, they were 250 a year. And today, eight years later, there's 250 a year. One thing we did develop that I think is helpful was a different way to treat the spina bifida, the myelomeninga seals. We began dividing the junction on the left between the spinal cord as it comes out of the spinal canal and where it connects with the bottom of the placode so that we remove the placode. And you see on the right slide that after you divide that junction, the spinal cord retracts and comes back up toward the spinal canal. And that was published in the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. Uh, treatment decisions about tumor patients were so difficult. So if a child came in with this CT scan and it shows what is probably a medulloblastoma, in the States we would get an MRI of the brain and we would get an MRI of the spinal canal to see if there's any spread of spinal fluid down, down along the spinal cord. Well, that would involve sending the patient down to Nairobi, paying for the scan, getting them back up, they couldn't afford an MR, much less a spine MR. And if I were to take out that medulloblastoma and the child postoperatively needed radiation therapy and chemotherapy, if they could afford it, it was available in Nairobi or in the far west in Eldoret, but almost nowhere else in Kenya. So should you operate on the patient? I mean, these are hard decisions. We, I saw many children with craniopharyngiomas. And a child who in the States who had this scan you see on the left would be treated either by complete removal and then post-op hormone replacements or subtotal removal, radiation and hormone replacements. But in Kenya, almost nobody could could afford the post-operative hormone replacements that they would need for life. <laughs> there was one child I paid for his vasopressin for about three years before the tumor came back and, and he died. And we saw children with craniopharyngiomas that were cystic. There's no P32 in Kenya, there's no yttrium but we did use bleomycin injections, repeated injections, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for a month, and that often result, resulted in a resolution of the size of the cyst, at least for several months. This may surprise you, but the years in Kajabi were the best years of my life. Uh, we had intended to stay six years, but uh, during the fourth year, I developed some extreme tiredness um, and it didn't get better after six months. So we came to the U.S. and it was diagnosed as a chronic fatigue syndrome. We went back for a couple of months to wind things up and then came back and settled in a suburb of uh, Chicago near Susan's son. And uh, medically, I still give lectures at Lurie Children's downtown, lectures at Tinwick Hospital in Kenya, and through Zoom at, in hospitals in other countries. I consult on cases from Africa. There were two cases of children with um, brain tumors this week. They come and I review articles for JNS and others. 
the other journals. But to reflect on the joys of the career, there was the joy of teaching residents and fellows, sometimes through lectures, sometimes through teaching surgical techniques, sometimes through teaching truisms they remembered, like treat this patient as if she were your own child. They remembered that, and sometimes through teaching a way of life. There was the joy of developing new treatments like the intrathecal baclofen, the intraventricular baclofen that improved the quality of life of children and their families. And there was the joy of, there is the joy of still receiving cards and letters and emails from children and their families that I treated 20 to 30 years ago. But some last thoughts. There were hard aspects of the career. Several years of two bad working relationships. The first few years when I came back to Children's in Pittsburgh and the four years in, in uh, Madison. There's a time commitment necessary to take care of the patients as if they were your children. There was the difficulty of extremely difficult cases, whether they were extremely difficult technically or emotionally or both. And three lawsuits I've done something like 13 or 14,000 operations and there were three lawsuits and one of them is still painful whenever I think about it. But the overwhelming emotion at the end of the career is not joy, it's actually gratitude from the depths of my being for being given the gift, the blessing to use a pastoral term of this career. Asante Sana is uh, thanks very in Swahili. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albright. Uh, what an incredible presentation. What a treat for all of our guests today. Um, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Dr. Freelander, would you like to start us off, please? Sure, thank you very much, Leland. What an inspiring <clears throat> talk and I really appreciate your openness and, and honesty and transparency to uh, you know your life and tribulations and different things that you've uh, been through as well as all the amazing successes. I know that there are many uh, of our residents uh, <clears throat> and uh, faculty that still talk about you. Uh, I walk by your picture every day uh, being an endowed uh, uh, being the name of an endowed uh, professorship. There's a picture right in our department and Dr. Albright uh, there's the Albright, the professor who uh, is being uh, held by uh, Ian Pollock uh, fittingly. So again, uh, I see you every day and smile uh, in that uh, you, you bring a lot of uh, uh, hope and happiness to, to many people and an, and an example to our current residents as well as a faculty. One, I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, people talk about necessity as the mother of invention and, you know, you've developed approaches to treat the children here in Pittsburgh. Uh, let's call it land of plenty uh, in terms of resources and different things uh, that that we have in, in the United States uh, as a whole. And you know, we often also complain that we don't have enough of certain things or another. And then when you were in Kenya, you also were developing um, new therapies or new approaches or you're obviously obviously being forced to develop something. So Take me a little bit through the thought process of of uh, of uh, both and how they contrast. In the United, if I think about the United States, there are still the thing I think about first is the children for whom we have no effective way to treat. Um, the children that I focused on that had spasticity and movement disorders, there are hundreds of thousands of children who have those problems. And there are very few pediatric neurosurgeons who have any interest in treating them. 
Number one, they're disabled. Um, number two, the things that we can do are not very high tech. They have some complications like baclofen pumps sometimes do. And yet, what I think first about is the things we aren't yet doing. Um, there are children with different movement disorders like uh, chorea and athetosis. How can, can they not be treated with um, certain types, certain new types of deep brain uh, stimulation or deep brain lesions? Cannot, they cannot, cannot they be helped with cortical motor stimulation or implants? So we have the high tech things and nobody, uh, almost nobody is treating them. I know that some people are implanting grids uh, permanently so that patients who are quadriplegic, their thoughts can generate uh, movement, but that's stuff that uh, those are treatments that cannot be done widely. And when you have hundreds of thousands of people with those disorders, we need to be looking at them. And in terms of Kenya, I think, or Sub-Saharan Africa, I think improving the hard problems there is far more difficult, partly because of the reasons I gave you about spina bifida. You know, they have many kids. There's no, they don't take folic acid. They um, they have fumonisin in the maze, and they, there's no abortions. And not one of those can be easily fixed. And so, some people have a fair number of respectable people have said what we need is more. Uh, pediatric neurosurgeons or neurosurgeons gen in general to go to underdeveloped countries in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I'm skeptical that any major improvement can be made in treating hydrocephalus or spina bifida in the next 20 years in the 200,000 children who develop hydrocephalus in sub-Saharan Africa every year. It's just, I have no idea how. That's probably as hard a question as you could have asked. Well, it's uh, to me, one of the you know, uh, proudest uh, components of my job is uh, seeing the the legacy that the uh, you know, University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons are uh, really in a, uh, leaving on the world and the implant and the imprint that we've uh, uh, created uh, you know talking about the you started your your presentation uh with a uh, peter janetta uh and clearly uh he changed the neurosurgery but as i see through the history of our department uh, the work that you've done the work that uh, dade lunsford Ian pollock uh, paul gardner just to mention a few and the legacy continues so you know uh, obviously uh, you have to understand your history to know where where you're going, and uh, you know the work that you've done. It's uh, it's uh, it's clearly that uh, obviously you've been in different places, but you're you're a Pittsburgh uh, uh, yeah. neurosurgeon uh, yeah. uh, always. Agreed. So thank you very much, and really appreciate uh, uh, this uh, really inspiring uh, talk, uh, uh, Justin. Uh, I know that there's some uh, questions, so uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Freelander. Um, just going to start with a couple of uh, comments first, um, Dr. Albright, that were left for you. Uh, Dr. Albright, what an incredible and interesting career you've led. You've touched so many lives in so many ways. Thank you. Uh, another comment, I I took you took care of my son many years ago in Pittsburgh as a patient. I still remember your kindness. God bless you. Uh, another comment here from um, Dr. Chris Comey. Uh, Dr. Albright, Thank you for being an inspiration and great teacher. Because of your example, I travel yearly to teach spine surgery at Pagando Medical Center in Mwanza, Tanzania. Asante sana. So, I'm glad I got to hear you say it first so I could say it back. <laughs> Um, uh, from uh, Dr. Lunsford here, uh, Leland, great talk. Both current and past residents in neurosurgery, neurosurgery are often perplexed on the work-life balance issues associated with our field. What advice can you give after your five decades in the field? Dave, I'm reticent to offer advice about that topic because 
so much depends on the neurosurgeon's family situation. Um, some neurosurgeons are married to others who are very understanding, maybe even married to medical personnel, but people that are quite understanding of the demands that we have to our patients and are willing to to bear the bulk of the responsibility of the family. Um, so I think it's an individual basis. Um, I don't believe that the reason that my first marriage ended was because of my devotion to the parents, uh, sorry, to the patients. Um, and I tried hard throughout that marriage to devote time to the, cho to the children. Um, so I don't think there is any, I don't think anyone could give, you, could give you one answer to your question. That's a second hard question in the last five minutes. Oh, uh, I'll give you a break with another uh, wonderful comment here from Dr. Uh, Ian Pollock. I'm grateful for the incredible legacy you have left on our division. You're a gifted teacher, a master surgeon, and a wonderful colleague. I learned so much from you, both in terms of neurosurgery, but also in terms of how to treat patients, families, and everyone else on the team. You have been a phenomenal role model. Lots of your former colleagues and friends have showed up to, to hear your talk today, Dr. Albright. Thanks. Um, here's a question for you. What do you think is the most important lesson a resident needs to learn about pediatric neurosurgery? Well, one, Two things came immediately to mind. One would be to treat the child, as I said, as if they were their own child. But secondly, it would be to communicate with patience and kindness to the parents, particularly the mother. One of the many, neuro, many neurosurgeons do not want to go into pediatric neurosurgery, partly because of the grief that's involved in it, but the others is because of the um, the stress of dealing with parents that are under such emotional stress. And so I think you have to be patient and understanding uh, with the parents, just as you are taking care of the kid, the child. Great, thank you. Um, what did you learn personally from your time in Africa? <laughs> oh, so many things. Uh, did nothing, so many things that nothing starts on time there. That tribalism is as endemic there as racism is here. That if we died there, it would have been in a road traffic accident. That I, I say this next, not critically, but just objectively. Christianity there is. Um, a centimeter deep and a kilometer wide. And there's not much emphasis on social justice or relationships. It's more on other aspects. I learned that Kenyans believed that uh, every missionary there was rich. And by their standards, we were, we are. And so we would be ask for money week after week and then determining who to give to and how much and who not to give to that was one of the hardest aspects of the whole time in kenya yeah that's great thank you um how closely do you still follow the research and and advances in technology in the world of neurosurgery well, pretty closely i mean i get uh Journal of Neurosurgery, uh, New England Journal, and JAMA every week. Or, the, you know, JNS is monthly, but I get the other two every week. I'm a, I'm a medical student at Pitts. Uh, what made you choose pediatric versus adult neurosurgery? <laughs> this sounds like a dopey answer but I just fell in love with it. I enjoyed taking care of the children, their problems. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of grief in it, but 
that just sort of came with the territory. I think it's it's at least partially true that the personalities of pediatric neurosurgeons are different from the personalities of adult, so-called adult neurosurgeons. You know, we are, um, I guess, stereotypically a little bit more like pediatricians than we would be like internists. Just different, there's some difference in our personalities. We are not bothered so much by the conditions they have and by all of the grief that's entailed in pediatric neurosurgery. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Albright. Um, when do you plan your next trip back to Africa and do you think about going every day? Um, I had planned to go, had tickets to go at the start of COVID and uh, it had to be canceled because of COVID. I'm not sure when we'll go back. I continue to give lectures there and I consult on cases. Um, I'm getting older now and those are hard trips. I would not want to go for a week or probably even two. I'd want it to be longer than that. I mean, three or four weeks. And um, right now I'm one of the pastors at Grace Lutheran Church locally. I preach there and in two retirement communities. I lead a lot of funeral services, visit a lot of sick people. And so maybe uh, when I end that in about a year and a half, uh, I could go again and spend more time there. But until then, I can contribute uh, by uh, uh, contribute electronically. That's wonderful. Um, Dr. Robert, thank you so much um, again for today. This was a, a lot of fun and again, a real treat for all those who are were on and, and will watch this in, in the pre-record in the uh, in the uh, the recorded version. So thank you again, incredible presentation. Thank you to all of our attendees. Again, if you have any other questions or would like to learn about ways to support the Department of Neurosurgery, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. Uh, we're so happy to stay connected with our friends this way. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to close us out for the day, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Leland, really, uh, thank you so much for this uh, presentation and uh, providing really a, a story of uh, of your life uh, in your professional life and uh, so many people have so much uh, to learn uh, uh, from you and the, the different ways that we deal with life and challenges as well as opportunities uh, in life and uh, I liked uh, your metaphor about the hinge and you, you just never know when your life's going to change and how it's going to change and why it's going to change and you just have to keep your eyes open and uh, really make the most of uh, of uh, the opportunities and as you've done help as many people as possible so really thank you so much for for your presentation uh, I know that many of our residents and uh, lots of other people will be watching it uh, as well so again uh, uh, thank you for 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 being part of this um, for our next uh, session Dr. Uh, Sean Eagle uh, who's a uh, part of our department uh, had a very, very nice uh, publication uh, featured uh, nationally and internationally discussing uh, the role of concussions in uh, suicides in, in, in adolescents. So uh, it'll be a very interesting uh, uh, talk will be in a couple of weeks. So look forward to seeing you all uh, then. Uh, have a wonderful uh, weekend. And, uh, and again, uh, Dr. Albright, thank you so much again. Take care. For the opportunity. Okay, bye-bye.